Welcome to Breast Friends Cancer Support Network, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Michelle Beck. I'm a two-time nine-year survivor of breast cancer. I'm the patient programs assistant at Breast Friends, and when I have time, I write at a blog called I Never Liked Pink. My guest today is Dr. Michelle Cambolis. She's a mind-body health specialist, a registered therapist, a meditation teacher, an author, and a speaker who uses all of this training and knowledge she has learned along the way to help so many. But today we're going to focus on this amazing book that she's written called When Women Rise, Everyday Practices to Strengthen Your Mind, Body, and Soul. And while the book doesn't focus on cancer, I felt like it's such an important topic to explore because it really focuses on how to get the life we want to live through meditation, mantras, and small day-to-day changes that we can all do. And so many of us have gone through cancer treatment. We feel stuck and stifled and lost. And I just finished this book last night and I've already started some of the recommended practices like journaling and meditation. And even in such a short time, it's really affected me. So I hope it will also really help all of you listeners out there. So Michelle, welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself, please, and why you have chosen to do this important work. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Michelle, and and sharing in uh, When Women Rise. I am a clinical therapist. I've been in private practice for over 25 years, and I shifted focus about 10 years ago to do a doctoral degree in mind-body medicine because I could see that the approaches that were being integrated in clinical... My apology. I just turned that off. That's okay. It happens. We're we're all, we, you know, life goes on. (laughs) Okay. Um, Do you want me to take it from the top? Um, Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Do you mind just feeding that question back to me? (laughs) Sure. So Michelle, welcome. Can you please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you do this very important work? Yes. Well, thank you, first of all, for having me on, Michelle. I just so appreciate um, being able to to speak with your listeners and share in the work of When Women Rise. And, um, you know, the back history is that I have been in clinical practice for the last 25 years, primarily working with women. And about 10 years ago, I decided to go back and do a doctoral degree in mind-body medicine because I felt that the traditional clinical counseling practices really just weren't hitting the mark in that they weren't addressing the whole being. And I recognized um, just increasingly through hearing the the stories and the lived experience of the women that I was working with, that it was just so important to begin to to integrate uh, more natural healing practices so that I could give them a sense of agency and sovereignty over their own health. And uh, so that's really the core of When Women Rise. Uh, uh, It's really a way to bring women together and center their hero stories and provide them with scientifically supported ways to be able to empower them towards their highest well-being. Well, I love that because you're obviously very busy in your life with your practice and, and, you know, you've, you're just busy with your clients and all these things. And you took the time to write this book. And I, at first I started it and I've, I would say I'm probably not as spiritual and grounded as I should be. So really, um, I started, I was like, okay, I'm going to read this book. And then as I got into it, I was like, wow, this, this all makes sense. It really is. It, it kind of really struck me. And I want to read one um, section here, something that you wrote at the end of the book in your paragraph titled or chapter titled rise. And it's called stillness. When we are still enough, long enough, we begin to see what is there. Sadness, joy, shame, fear, all waiting in the chambers of the heart, longing to be seen, heard, held. You could not have known what was building behind the fog of the doing, striving, proving. You could not see until the stillness awakened you, like the sun awakens the bud to flower. But you cannot force the bloom. 
May you rest in your stillness. May you soften your effort and may you discover yourself again, radiant, pure light. Hmm. I, I read that last night and it, it just struck my heart so much. And I, it really, it brought the whole book together for me. You know, there's, there's so many things throughout the book. You have different chapters on various things on meditations. Well, there's meditations throughout the entire book and it's super cool listeners. There's QR codes in there. So you literally just take your phone, go over the QR code and then just sit and listen. And, um, I have to say, I didn't do that as much when I was reading because most of my reading time was spent while my son was in Taekwondo class. Uh, <laughs> so I've gone back and done the meditations and they're just super calming and they really, they, your intent has worked out. So I love that. <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to hear that. I really wanted to be able to create a book that was, a process, a path, a, um, a way for us to be able to integrate these practices on a day-to-day -day basis, no matter where we happen to be. So mm -hmm. the fact that you were um, connecting in with and activating that, that natural capacity for your mind-body system to heal and thrive as you're sitting at your son's Taekwondo practice. And I hear of other women, you know, practicing as they're sitting in the parking lot, um, mm -hmm. waiting for their child to come out of school. They might do five minutes of breath work or a meditation um, or another mind body health practice. And the, the recordings um, are, are there to guide you uh, to that inner wisdom that you already have. And so, you shared um, that poem that really in essence is about dropping the efforting and dropping the striving and letting go of this idea that somehow we need to be more, add more and be better in some way. And instead um, really come home to the truth that we are already whole. And we live in this culture of stress we're breathing the air of fear and so many women tell me that they feel utterly exhausted by by this culture of stress bodies mired in anxiety our nervous systems taxed by chronic stress and so we in turn feel disconnected from ourselves and we spend so much time ruminating about the past or worrying about the future that we lose touch with the beauty of life as it is right now. Well, that's something I actually wanted to talk about because let's, and really dig into how the book works. So since almost two years ago, you know, beginning of 2020, we've been living in such a difficult time when, and so many women have also gone through cancer treatment at the same time as this pandemic. And what are some of the key ways that we can bolster our well being? right now when things may still seem so bleak? Well, that's, I don't think there's a question more important than that. And I think about how difficult it's been for most of us going through COVID and then adding um, treatments and, um, you know, facing uh, cancer during this time, it seems like in no, an inordinate, um, Oh, overwhelming uh, mm -hmm. reality. And there are many things that we can do in the most difficult of circumstances to come home to a sense of greater calm. And I mean, I think for me, the breath is actually our, our best tool, our most potent tool in being able to send a message to our body that we're okay in this moment we're okay and you know we take 20,000 breaths a day and that's 20,000 invitations to come into the moment and activate a release of soothing neurochemicals that can elicit that calming response and so just simply taking a low and slow breath or breathing in for four holding for four exhaling for six, holding for two, elongating that exhale activates the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calming part of our nervous system. 
So the breath is key training our body for calm. So that would really be the first step We're we're starting with the breath work. And, and like you said, it really can be done anywhere when you're waiting for this or waiting for that. And it's actually, I've used this technique with my, I have a 10 year old son who does have, have some anxiety and we will breathe together. We will sit down sometimes when he's going through something and I'm like, okay, just, just stop. And let's breathe. And I've, I've taught him the box breathing and some other things that I have learned through, through various things over the years. And it, it, it's amazing how just taking that time and focusing on your breath can make those that day so much better. Yes. It, and it hijacks that fight or flight response, returning mm-hmm. us to that sense of steadiness. And it seems so simple, um, but it, it, it's so powerful. And, um, and Um, And my advice is to practice that form of breathing when you're not in a a state of panic. So if we practice um, that breathing method throughout the day, the the body just begins to naturally regulate itself on its own and muscle tension decreases. um, The breathing becomes more deep. Uh, the blood pressure decreases, heart rate decreases, and we no longer have that sense of perceived danger. Totally makes sense. You have to practice to make it work. <laughs> that, yeah. Um, and so- the breath returns us to the now. It's very difficult to be worrying about the future if you're, if you're in the present. And um, so there's research that, that, that tells us that we're in the past or the future 50% of the time. So that's 50% of our life that we're missing. Right, because we're thinking about, oh gosh, what happened then or what might happen. So how do you think, especially for like my listeners who have gone through a cancer treatment and survivorship and treatment, those the unknown is so terrifying. And how, what kind of advice do you have for women um, who are facing uncertainty to feel more empowered? Practices that help us to develop a more equanimous relationship with our mind um, are, are so um, helpful during you know times of fear because of course the, the the fearful mind is going to go into the future. It wants to predict what might happen, and so it's really important that we're compassionate with ourselves, understanding that the mind is doing that because it has an activated survival response. So it's actually trying to help us, ironically, even though um, in, in a sense, it's taking us into sometimes terror thoughts. So practices like meditation help us to learn to just observe the thinking mind from afar so that we no longer believe those thoughts so much or add more to the story. So Tara Brock, wonderful um, wisdom teacher, talks about the double arrow. The first arrow is the suffering that comes with facing a health crisis or those really scary thoughts that you have. Mm -hmm. The second arrow is where we add more to the story. And, And with meditation, we can learn to observe those thoughts and watch them arise, exist, and fall away they're impermanent. Those thoughts are impermanent. Mm -hmm. Um, So meditation is a powerful tool to be able to make friends with the thinking mind. Got it. It, it really, it covers so, so many different things. And throughout the book, you have meditations for um, welcoming, awakening, sleep, rest, that it really runs the gamut. Um, so I obviously it's, I really love the book, uh, <laughs> but let's turn to anxiety because that is, it really affects us so much. And especially for us cancer survivors, we, when we have tests coming up or scans, we call it scanxiety because it just really sets our, our life afire again. What are some of the practices that can help calm the limbic system that, that rules our anxiety? There's a whole host of practices that root in um, really supporting the body. So anxiety is the body's way of telling us that it feels that it's in danger. We talked about um, changing um, your breathing in order to um, teach the body, uh, you know, a sense of calm. 
Um, we really want to make sure that we're coming back to the base, basics when, when we're facing crisis of, of any kind. So focusing on your sleep life, ensuring that you're getting um, a deep rest, supporting your body with whole foods, taking rest, moving your body, getting out in nature is incredibly supportive to your body's healing process and leaning into our supports. We know that that tend and befriend um, uh, process, it increases oxytocin, which it helps to amplify that sense of well-being. And um, I think we've got time today to get into some more specific practices that you can do right here, right now. Perfect. I love that. And we are going to go take a short break. So listeners, please stay with us. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to our program. I'm Michelle Beck, and my guest is Dr. Michelle Kambolis. We've been talking about the strategies to strengthen your mind, body, and soul. And before break, we were talking about just the different overall practices that we can do. But you're in your book, there's a lot of meditation, and it's you have it bookended by stories about actual patients that you've had and known, and it really it brings it all to center. But I know for some people out there, meditation is hard. Um, and you know, some people are like, oh gosh, I, I just don't know how to do it. You know, what, what advice do you have for them? Oh, there are so many myths about meditation. So, I mean, maybe the most helpful thing that I can do is dispel some of those myths. And the first myth is that when we enter into meditation, the mind will shut off and people get very frustrated quite quickly when they realize that the mind actually, it doesn't shut off. <laughs> it goes <laughs> and goes and goes and it's wildly unruly. And so meditation isn't about shutting off the mind. It's about developing a different relationship with the mind. And um, in time, you begin to access a spaciousness between those thoughts um, and then the other myth is that meditation feels good and meditation doesn't always feel good because med meditation is designed to show us what's there, to reveal and allow us to be able to awaken and see the emotions and um, the physical experiences, the sensations, and yes, the thoughts for what they are. And as we open compassionately to a greater inner awareness, then all of those thoughts and emotions just start to naturally metabolize and dissipate. And so they're no longer so solid. So I would just really encourage people to persevere and know that there are times when meditation does feel uncomfortable, but with the tools of meditation, you, you can begin to um, open to that discomfort and allow it to, to move through um, activating self-healing and activating um, the parts of the brain that support regulation and, and most importantly, more self-compassion. Mm -hmm. You definitely, you definitely talk about self-compassion and self-forgiveness and some, some things like that in the, in the book. But one of the um, meditations that you, you highlighted in the book is actually one of my favorites and I was familiar with it. Uh, it's a Hawaiian and I'm going to butcher the name. Uh, Ho'oponopono. <laughs> Ho'oponopono. I was really close. And, and the tenets of that there's, it's four basic lines. There's, there's, there's a lot that goes into the actual practice of it, but it is, I'm sorry please forgive me. I love you. I thank you. Mm -hmm. And it, the first time I'd read that a while ago, I, it was just one of those things that really stuck with me. And I actually have those, those lines written on a post-it in my mirror. Um, because it just, it really allows you to just stop work through whatever you're working through and move forward. And I, I love that one. So, um, I wanted to know what, what is your greatest hope for women when they're reading this book, when women rise? 
My greatest hope is that this book serves as a homecoming, a path to connect in deeply with the true self, that it provides women with the tools and practices to be able to um, live a gentler, wiser, more compassionate way, that women have the courage to um, create a life that is not so aligned with this cultural system of proving and competing and comparing and always um, striving for more, that women um, understand that they're already enough, have always been enough. And if they create a certain kind of ecosystem for themselves, they can thrive in their highest well-being. And one of the things you really, you do talk about is how much stress affects us women in this, this cultural day and age, the pressure that is put upon us culturally, but also that we put on ourselves by trying to do everything and be everything. It's, it's, you know, culturally, oh, it's part of your nature. You're, you're nurturing, you take care of everyone, you're caregivers, but you're also expected to work and do this and this and this, and it leads to so much stress which we're trying to dial down by using these practices, but is all stress bad? Because I imagine it, it goes back to our, you know, ancient times where we needed the stress to learn to hunt and gather is, is my guess. So we need to have some of it, right? <laughs> we do need some of it. And all stress is not bad. Absolutely not. In fact, quite the contrary. We know that short-term stress is actually really important for our mind-body system. It helps us to become more alert and clear and perform better. And, um, you know, it also is an important part of our safety system. So right. if we're walking in the street and a car zooms by, we want to be able to kind of pull back and retract. If we're, you know, playing soccer, <laughs> we need to be enlivened and, and perform well. We want our, our, um, uh, stress levels to increase in order to, be able to, you know, do our, do our, our task well. And short bursts of stress also improve our immune system. So the idea is not to have the same steady, um, calm state all the time. Our health is actually connected to heart rate variability. It's about our, our ability to recover. Okay. It's long-term chronic stress that increases our cortisol levels, that has an impact on the health of our organs, that leads to um, illnesses and conditions like digestive disorders, chronic mm -hmm. pain, metabolic disorders, heart disease, and yes, cancer. And we know that um, estimates are, are showing us that about 75% of visits to, to the doctor's office are due to stress-related illnesses. Wow. So this fast paced culture is really costing us dearly. God, that's, it's, it's so unfortunate, but that's why we need people like you out there trying to help women and give them the tools they need to really have a better, healthy day-to-day -day life. And you mentioned, you mentioned, you know, the benefits of meditation, but how are there any specific benefits for the cancer community itself? Oh, yes. In fact, um, there's a whole host of studies that um, that show that um, meditation um, really supports recovery. And, um, and so, you know, maybe I can send you um, those that you can, you know, share in your, in mm -hmm. your notes. Um, and, and so supports recovery, and it also supports how you how you meet yourself through the process. Um, meditation helps you to, you know, carry um, intention and awareness as you're moving through your treatment and recovery process. So you can greet that process with fear or uncertainty or panic. Um, and, and those emotions are gonna arise, you know, anyway, from time to time. Um, but what meditation does is it, it allows you to become aware of the 
emotions as they're arising and gives you kind of a pathway to, um, to shape your response differently. So it really puts you back in the driver's seat in terms of um, how, you're, how you're meeting yourself during these really scary processes. Got it. And I I meant to ask you a question earlier when we were talking about the stress. Um, What is and why is it important to address culturally based stress? I was taking notes in the book and I was like, how do we define culturally based stress? (laughs) Well, if we were looks to if we were to look specifically about uh, at stress as a feminist issue, we know that girls and women in every country on this planet face gender-based inequality, they face workplace inequity, oftentimes they face violence, um, high rates of of abuse. And so that would be a very serious example of culturally based stress for women specifically. And then, you know, there are all kinds of other ways that we that we all experience an inordinate amount of stress. I mean, just look at the increase in technology and the way that we're trying to process information at a breakneck speed and the impact that that has on our mind-body system. Mm -hmm. Um, So our our fast-paced culture is um, probably the biggest example of where stress has become unmanageable. And, and we just don't even realize it because we're taking so much on. And then at the end of the day, it's like, sometimes you can't even relax because you're like, okay, I had to do this and this and that, and I didn't get that done and that done. And it's like, how, how do we work through that? It's so challenging. Um, We know that in the case of emails, and so I'm not even talking about social media and phones right now, but just checking an email, it takes 20 minutes for your body to recover and go back to baseline after that elevated um, sense of um, um, alertness and Mm -hmm. um, activation that technology causes. Well, that's also too, one of the reasons why it's so well, well, well said that, you know, get off technology for at least an hour before you go to bed. So you can allow your body to, to actually rest And I like, for me, I'm that person that if I have unread email in my, in my inbox, I have a hard time like going to sleep because I'm like, I need to, like, I need to get it all done every day, which it's, it's never possible. So I've, I've just kind of had to get to that point where I'm like, okay, there's always going to be some that you're going to work on tomorrow. That's hard for me, but it's a change, um, that I know is good for me. Um, so one other thing that, oh, sorry, go ahead. (laughs) I was going to say it's so highly addictive. It is. We get that dopamine rush every time we check technology. And so it is, it's highly addictive. And so you can feel it yourself just in resisting that desire to return the email. Yeah. It takes a lot of um, commitment and self-control to, um, to resist and c- to create blackout periods. And that's where it's so important that we're having conversations with our employers, or if, you know, if you are an employer, uh, mm-hmm. setting the, an example so that we aren't, um, holding an expectation that work life and home life are t- together as one. Well, and especially the last few years when so many of us are working from home, it's having problems setting those boundaries. Um, A few times my, my husband has asked me because he has one, like, he's like, do you want an Apple watch? I was like, no, no, I do not. Like I I'm connected enough with my phone. I don't need it on my arm. No, no (laughs) No. Apple watch. (laughs) It's got a chance. Great for some people, but not for me. Um, One thing I have also noticed, um, that sound in in your book and sound plays a huge role in our bodies as well. And I have found that, especially in the past two years, when my whole family is at home, my son's school, my husband, and I both working from home, I'm just craving silence. Mm. Like I will come up to my office, which is our bonus room, game room, multi-purpose room, and just shut the door and just sit here because I need to not hear anything sometimes. <laughs> Well, the gift is sil- of silence is that you can actually hear more. You can hear more of your own um, inner voice 
and you can hear the resonance of sounds that normally you would miss. So when we sit in silence with meditation, we might anchor in the breath, but in time, we expand that sense of awareness to include sound. And as you observe sound, you begin to realize, wow, like this sound, it arises, it exists, and then it just dissolves, it just falls away, just like every aspect of life. And so maybe I don't need to take um, you know, the fact that my partner didn't put his dish away so seriously, <laughs> right? <laughs> or that fear that's arising really does have a beginning and a middle and an end. Perfect. And in your, in the book, you use examples about one of your patients coming because like all of the little noises of like the keyboard typing or people eating, were making them crazy. And it's just figuring out how to, how to work with that. And because noises aren't going to go away, but it's finding the ones that soothe our soul or trying to dampen the ones that, that don't work for us. Oh, her nervous system was so taxed that the sound of her partner eating an apple or opening up a bag just sent her into this extraordinary fight or flight response. And um, so it, it took some work in order to help her to calm the limbic system mm -hmm. so that she could begin to just tolerate sound. Um, our bodies are so sensitive. And when we have high, high levels of stress, and trauma, mm -hmm. uh, it can be very difficult to cope with the day to day. Now, how, how does someone like myself or our listeners out there discover the things that really support or hinder them in getting a good sense of fulfillment of their day to day lives? Well, I think that the pathway to joy and meaning and happiness is so different for all of us and very unique to us. So it is, it's an exploration um, of really getting to know yourself well. And I think honoring the body is so important. Movement, um, I I'd, I'd sort of talked about the importance of connecting in with nature and, um, and finding rituals to rest into throughout our day that allow us to just take a sacred pause, a moment of awareness to, to be in awe and appreciation for our lives. That's and perfect. I do want to talk a little bit more about, about ritual when we get back, but we do need to take another short break. So listeners stay with us. If you would like to be a guest on my show, you can email me at Michelle Beck at breastfriends.org with, um, your stories of inspiration, what helped you through your cancer journey or how your life has changed for the better since cancer. So stay with us. We'll be back more in a bit. Welcome back to our show. I'm Michelle Beck and my guest is Dr. Michelle Kambolis. We've been talking about stress that so many women feel in their lives and how to move forward and beyond to heal and to thrive. And before break, we were talking about different rituals that we can go through in our day to really just help us get to a better place and a better plane overall. And one of the things I wanted to talk about was breath work and something that I read about in the book, which I thought was fascinating was Vu breathing. And I was doing it myself as I was reading the book in Taekwondo class, like trying to do it quietly. <laughs> so can we, can you give us an example of how, how we do that? Yeah. So, um, Vu breathing activates the vagus nerve and the vagus nerve plays the main role in responding to cues of safety and, and danger. And it's um, connects the mind body system. And it's really um, important to uh, soothing and calming. And um, so it's this communication system for the mind, the heart and gut instincts. And so Vu breathing, it tones that, that vagus nerve and, um, and, Trauma therapists have discovered that it helps to release, release the freeze response when we've experienced trauma. So it's very, very simple. Mm -hmm. It's super effective. And um, it just involves taking a moment to connect with the body, 
just that might mean for you coming into stillness, but by no means do you need to be, um, you know, in a meditative posture or anything like this. This is a technique that you can use anytime. In fact, I've you know, used it with my kids in the car and you're going to start with a low and slow breath in. So we can just begin now two, three, four, five, and exhale with a low voo. Ooh. Inhale again and just send that resonant sound all the way down through the chest, down to the sex organs and the perineum. Ooh. I like it. Okay, so hopefully listeners joined us and that's something that you can do over and over and over again. And, and if you participated, you might notice an increase in the vibration through the body, maybe a sense of warmth, um, maybe an increase in energy. And so this Vu chanting, it triggers a release of a, of a very imp important neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which reduces the heart rate, the blood pressure, supports digestion, and um, elicits a sense of overall calm. Oh, that's perfect because we all need more of that. It's One like thing. PRN, like for me, it's nature's Ativan. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, and you mentioned, mentioned that the different things is that that released oxytocin in the body. And it's just those by just these simple practices, our body can make all these things that really can help us get through the day. We just don't do it enough. Um, yes, and sometimes we complicate things and we think that something simple can't possibly be effective. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and we also expect a change right away. So when we, you know, just take a moment to bring in some patience and, and some um, a friendliness to what we're doing and understanding that it takes time to, with neuroplasticity, it takes time to change those brain pathways. Well, and one of the other things you talk about in the book, which I have also, I found very effective was mantras finding as part of your daily rituals, set up some time where you find the mantra that works for you. And in the book, there's a whole list. And the one that really stuck in my heart was I am grateful for this body, this breath and this life. And that one, I read the list of how many ever there were. And that one just resonated with me hundred percent because mm. I've been through, you know, cancer twice and some other really challenging experiences, but I'm still here and my body is supporting me and the breath is keeping me alive. And I have a wonderful life, you know, the, yes, there's stress, but I'm so grateful to be here. So I've actually, I wrote it down, um, in a few places around my house to remind myself whenever I'm passing by just to stop and read it. The life affirming mantra and gratitude is one of the most potent tools that we have for self healing and um, and creating a life of of deep meaning and well being and um, our our critical mind you know again it's part of that survival response so natural um, that we're you know trying to prevent the kinds of conditions that cause suffering. Um, but it means that we have to work extra hard in order to shape the brain towards appreciation, gratitude, awe. There's a wonderful um, technique that positive psychologists use. So Martin Seligman, who's the grandfather of positive uh -huh. psychology, did, did this That's study. Great. And he had people write down three things that went well and why every day for a week and their happiness levels increased for over a month. So that's far after they stopped writing down uh, what they most appreciated. Mm -hmm. So it really creates a fundamental change in, um, in, in, in us. 
I actually, I had, I have so many journals sitting around that I've been given for various things. And I actually went and pulled one out when I was reading the book and reading that section. And I've started to do that. Not so much three things that, you know, went well that day, but just three things that I'm grateful for every day. Mm -hmm. And there's so much like so, even, even right now, when I'm suffering from side effects from my medication, I'm in chronic pain, I'm healing from a back injury, you know, life happens, but I still, there's so many wonderful things out there and writing it down and just putting it to paper really resonates with your brain and your body. And like, okay, I can, I can move forward because it's not as bad as I thought it was. And you're saying something that's so important, which is the gratitude is really in those small, simple things that are right before us in a delicious cup of tea in, you know, the feeling of your partner's hand in um, hearing our children laugh. Um, maybe it's, um, you know, just a tree outside your window. So, so often we're looking for those big macro moments in order to feel an appreciation for this one given life that we know of. And yet really our, uh, the beauty of our lives built up on these micro moments that can weave the blanket of our life. So just in, in that practice that you're talking about, you know, here you're, you know, struggling with side effects and um, the impact of treatment. And yet those moments of appreciation um, just kind of brings you back to the beauty right in front of you. So one of the things that I really resonated with in the book was how are we supposed to cultivate deep rest and deep sleep? Because myself included, it's a big problem after cancer treatment that so many women have is insomnia. And if we're not getting a good night's sleep, the rest of the day can just seem like a total train wreck. So what are your, some, do you have helpful practices that we can do to, to turn this around? Great question. So there are some very practical things that you can do to reclaim your sleep life. Um, and before you enter into those, I, I always sort of welcome people to ask themselves um, about the mindset that they hold around sleep, because so many of us have inherited this belief that sleep is a waste of time. So um, I it's love sleep. Really, um, me too. <laughs> me too. And it's important to know that um, it's a time when your mind body system is doing a great deal of healing. And so um, just honoring the importance of sleep life is, is the first step and, and understanding um, and welcoming it rather than resisting and seeing it as something that doesn't have value in your life. So that's the first thing in terms of practical pieces, um, cutting down on caffeine, I think is probably one of the most important things that you, that you can do. So, um, you know, if you're having caffeine, um, have it in small doses, uh, avoid caffeine after one 30, check your food labels when you're, um, uh, when you're, trying to cut down on, on caffeine because caffeine can creep up in, in um, surpri surprising ways. <laughs> Sometimes caffeine is in yogurt, in granola bars. What? You'd be surprised yeah. what foods have caffeine in it. Yeah, so um, just switch to chamomile tea, which we know is um, apigenin. So it's a flavonoid found in many fruits and vegetables that, um, helps to calm the body. And then you also want to tamp down on alcohol, which is a stimulant. And, sure. um, I, I know that, you know, many of us enjoy a glass of red wine or something to unwind at the end of the day, but alcohol can really interfere with sleep. And, and often if you're, um, having alcohol, the, uh, liver is working really hard at about two or three in the morning. So that's when you end up waking up and having a hard time falling back to sleep. And um, be careful with the strenuous exercise towards the end of the day, because that is also really um, activating. So mm -hmm. if you want to work out towards the end of the day, opt for um, gentler exercise rather than hard cardio. We know 
that it's important to put technology away, mm -hmm. um, put, put it to bed at least one and a half hours before you hit the pillow yourself. Mm -hmm. um, not only does the blue light of the screen lower your body's melatonin levels, but um, the emails and the messages keep your brain alert. And in, in terms of, you know, when you're facing worries, nighttime can feel like it's just not your friend. So earlier in the day, so maybe a couple of hours before you go to bed, you might bring out a journal and place your worries there. Just allow yourself to um, write down a free flow um, of, of, of information, write down the thoughts, allow them to live in the journal, and then make a conscious choice to store them there rather than repeat them over and over and over again in your mind. And most people find that if they write them down, they no longer have to kind of chew on those thoughts because they, mm -hmm. they allow it to live someplace else. Yeah. I am definitely one of those people that cannot shut off my mind at night. So a while ago I started doing meditations from my Peloton app or from the calm app, something that I, I have headphones, I just put it on and it just allows me to, it shuts my brain off. It's, but it's something that I can focus on. So I'm not focusing on my oh my gosh, what happened today and what's going to happen tomorrow. So it's but really about finding what works best for you to, you know, and put all those practices in place. Um, gosh, we only have a couple more minutes, but so much good to talk about. Um, so let's talk about the, how can we recognize the signs of stress in our body to initiate some of these practices to get the better well mind body connection. Anxiety symptoms show up in a whole host of different ways. And, um, and so let's start with the body. You might notice um, an increased thirst. You might notice having to go to the washroom more often, difficulty sleeping, um, increase or decrease in appetite, heart racing, cold hands and feet. And you might notice it, a difference in the thinking mind ruminating, um, black and white thinking, irritability, you might notice, um, oh, obsessing about different things. Uh, so it shows up in the cognitive system. And then it also shows up in our felt experience in um, agitation, fear, panic. And um, so if you notice that you're having these experiences and the list is actually much, much longer, it's important to, to not ignore it. If people go on average 10 years without getting support for anxiety, and yet it's the most treatable of all mental health conditions. Only one out of four will get help at all, but it's an internal kind of suffering and people don't see it. So that's why far too often it's long ignored. I developed anxiety in my mid forties. And, um, for me, I definitely, I, I take medication for it and it, it helps a lot, but also if you're, fe you're starting to feel those come up in your body, that's when you should employ the practices that you've talked that you talked about in the book, the breathing, the mantras, the meditation, all good things to bring your body back to center so much good information and God, Michelle, we're almost out of time. So please tell our listeners how they can find you, find you, find the book, all of, all of the ways they can get on the Michelle Kambola's train. Oh, wonderful. I'd love to hear from your listeners. I'm at michellekambolis.com. I'm very active on, um, on social media. We have all kinds of enriching conversations there. If you direct message me, I always respond and it's always me that responds. And we have a Monday meditation group that, um, where we collect every Monday to deepen into these practices. And you can also find me on insight timer. Perfect. Michelle, thank you so much for being here today. It has been such a pleasure and reading this book really opened up me to a lot of 
things that I was kind of familiar with, but really needed to do better. So it has helped me a lot. So, and remember listeners, michellecambolis.com, Michelle with one L on Instagram at Michelle Cambolis, Facebook at M Cambolis and Twitter at Cambolis. So all with one L. So search her that way and find her. So listeners out there, if you or a loved one need our services, please visit breastfriends.org. You can make a donation on our website or by texting BF radio to 41444 to help breast friends continue on its mission to ensure that women do not go through cancer alone. You can find our show on many platforms on voice America health and wellness channel or you can nominate or wherever you find your platforms where your podcast woo, live, live radio, the joy of it. So Michelle, thank you so much again. It has been my pleasure to have you here. Um, listeners will be back next week. And until then, remember we rise by lifting each other. <laughs>